Hello, and welcome to the Stonebridge Podcast. Uh, I am, as always, your host, Peter Goodman. I'm here in Berkeley, and with me again today is Michael Palmer in New York. Now, if you don't know, Stonebridge is a book publisher with books on a variety of Asian-related subjects, most of them having to do with Japan, and that's because I started out my publishing career in Tokyo, and I worked uh, overseas for 10 years, and I came back to the U.S. with no other set of discernible skills. So that's what I did then, and that's what I'm continuing to do. And you can find out more about Stonebridge Press at www.stonebridge.com. And these days, uh, you can also find us on Substack and on Twitter and Facebook, at least until Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> either run them both into the ground or uh, trade them to the Soviets for a couple of vintage tanks they can play soldier in. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, like I said, uh, Stonebridge Press does mostly books having to do with Japan, and our podcast today uh, uh, takes its cue from that. Uh, we start up in 1991 or 1989, depending on who's telling the story. And uh, actually, it's me in both cases. Uh, <laughs> and about 10 years after that, we published a book on what to me was a completely fresh form of introspection, meditation, and healing. And that book, Nikon, Gratitude, Grace, and the Japanese Art of Self-Reflection, was written by Greg Creech and got a lot of favorable mention and awards. And it was Greg's idea to commemorate the 20th anniversary of that publication with a new edition of his book. And that new anniversary edition of Nikon was just released yesterday, November 15th. And further, that's why Greg is here on the podcast today. And it's getting to be Thanksgiving. The name of the holiday says it all. It's a time to be grateful for all the blessings in our lives. And that's certainly one of the things that we want to talk about today. But first off, congratulations on the new publication, Greg, and welcome. Well, thank you, Peter. And and uh, thank you so much for basically uh, doing all of the hard work of getting that new publication out in terms of everything that has to be done. Um, when people think of a book, they often associate it with the author. But as an author, I can tell everybody that there's a huge amount of work that are done by many, many people um, in the publishing end of things. And so thank you for all that effort on your on your oh end. Oh my gosh, thank you. We we <laughs> never hear that, Greg. So that's <laughs> really so uh you I think are that, I think that's the end of the podcast, right? Yeah, that? That's it. We can all go I can go home. home. <laughs> yeah, I'll send your check and we'll be arriving tomorrow. Uh, so uh Greg, um you are considered one of the leading authorities on Japanese psychology in North America. And for many years, uh, you and your wife, uh, Linda, have been uh, running the uh, Todo Institute, that's T-O-D-O, -O, which is an education and retreat center in Vermont. Uh, you're located just south of Burlington. I'd say you were also appointed chairperson of a national task force on Buddhism and mental health. And I'd certainly like to hear more about that a bit later. But first off, uh, could you tell us a bit about what Nikon is? What does the word Nikon mean? And what is Japanese psychology? Uh, and is Japanese psychology different from, say, Western psychology or Indian psychology? Okay. Let me, um, by the time I get to the third question, I may oh, okay. get it. But <laughs> we'll I'll, get back I'll, start, I'll start with the Don't first worry. one, which is um, basically what, what is Nikon? What The, the word Nikon uh, actually means something like um, looking from the inside or inside looking. And so it's really a method of self-reflection or introspection. And uh, my original uh, introduction to this was really through Buddhism, a particular uh, type of Buddhism called uh, Shin Buddhism or Pure Land Buddhism. And it was it's a form of Buddhism that I think has the potential for both self-awareness and kind of what I call softening the heart. But I think the idea of self-reflection uh, beyond any particular method, and, and Nikon, of course, is the method that I have a lot of experience with, but I really think that it's an element of life that's missing for most people, particularly in our society as it is constructed today with, with all of the technology and the busyness and, and uh, activity that people have, that we tend to divide our time between being busy and active and then kind of zoning out either um, on the internet or in, in front of a 
streamed movie or television show. Um, and self-reflection doesn't really get much airtime. And I think part of what I'm trying to do is encourage people to build in just a little bit of space in their day for self-reflection, because I think it can have a dramatic effect on people's lives in particular on their relationships. So uh, from a standpoint of Japanese psychology, uh, Nikon is one kind of method or methodology in what I call Japanese psychology. And uh, when when people ask me kind of what is Japanese psychology for years, I found it very difficult to answer that in a concise way. But but after 30 years, I finally have a, uh, an idea of how to really describe that, which I think also shows a little bit about the distinction between Japanese and Western um, views of, of psychology. And I think there's three pillars that I think are prominent in Japanese psychology, and they're all shifts. And so the, the first shift, which really I think is has to do with, with the Nikon material that we're talking about and what's in my book, is a shift from what I would call a complaint-based life to a life of authentic appreciation and gratitude. Um, and I think many of us, by habit, are caught up in that complaint-based life. And so here's a method of self-reflection that helps us kind of work with our perspective and work with our habit, including our habit of speech, so that we can um, start to shift towards really appreciating what goes on in our life instead of just um, putting so much energy into complaining. So that's the first kind of shift in Japanese psychology. The second is a shift from what I would call um, self-focus to, to focus on the world around us. And I think part of what I understand from Japanese psychology is that there's a real connection between what we call self-focused attention or attention on oneself um, and suffering. And if we can make that shift where we can put our attention not just on what's going on inside us, our thoughts, our feelings, um, our mood today, but what's going on around us, you know, that I, I took a walk this morning. This Today is the first day of winter in Vermont, meaning that we have four inches of snow on the ground. And so I got to take a walk with my daughter's puppy before the sun even came up. And, you know, it was just extraordinary to kind of be out in the snow again. I'm not a skier, a big winter person, but just uh, after a most of the year of not experiencing snow, it really is quite an amazing experience just to to take a walk in the snow. And it was a wet snow and all the branches are kind of lined with a little thin layer of, of you know, white carpeting. And it's, it's turning our attention toward the world around us. I think it's one of the things I learned in haiku is the ability to write poems in which the poet is not the center of the poem. And it's one of the ways I distinguish, I think, a lot of haiku poetry from Western poetry. Um, so that shift of attention away from ourselves and onto the world around us, which sets up a connection between us and the world around us. And the third uh, shift that I see in Japanese psychology is what I call the shift from uh, a feeling-centered approach to life to a purpose-centered approach to life. And so the focus in a lot of Western psychology tends to be on our, our feelings and thoughts. You know, uh, So it's not unusual if you walk into a therapist's office that the first question might be, how are you feeling today? Um, but in Japanese psychology, and this comes more from the Marita therapy side of the work, um, there's really a shift to purpose. You know, what, what is it that I need to do that's important for me to do before I die? Um, what, are, what are my goals? What are my aspirations? What is it that I'm here on this planet to actually do with my life? Those are all questions that relate to purpose. And so they're more the centerpiece of this approach to psychology than what I call our internal experience of thoughts and feelings. You just brought up uh, a number of very, very interesting points that I want to get to. Uh, before we do that, though, I, I think most people listening understand, in principle, what self-reflection means. But uh, when you're talking about self-reflection vis-a-vis uh, -vis Nikon, you're, you're referring to a particularly structured form of self-reflection, not simply sitting down and thinking about yourself, but going through certain, uh, say, mental processes or, or asking yourself certain specific questions. And those were codified or developed in Japan uh, as a kind of a formal structure, uh, as part of a, a larger uh, psychotherapeutic uh, approach. Uh, to living, and then it's been adopted into the West wholesale or modified in some way. You're absolutely right that that the the Nikon approach to self-reflection 
is an approach that is very structured, meaning there's an actual methodology to it. Right. And when I first uh, started working on, on my book over 30 years ago, and I started researching self-reflection as it related to um, spirit spirituality in particular, what I found is that the idea of self-reflection was promoted in almost every spiritual tradition. But uh, there were very limited approaches where they provided the mechanics of how to actually do that, right? And so there's a difference, I think, between somebody uh, taking a weekend and going, um, isolating themselves, let's say, in a cabin or a retreat center someplace in silence, and just kind of thinking about themselves in their life and going through the Nikon process, which is this structured process that's based on three questions. And it's based on the idea that we can learn to understand ourselves by um, our, through our relationships, by looking at our relationships with other people as a mirror of our life that gets us to see ourselves often in a very different kind of way. So I think that uh, what Nikon offers is, is a structured approach that actually is possible for even young children. My my own children, who were introduced to this when they were quite young, were were doing some form of Nikon uh, as early as four or five years old. And that's not unusual in, in Japan either uh, for that to be happening. So the questions themselves are very simple to understand. It's the practice of it that that really requires a kind of sincerity, uh, honesty in terms of, of examining our lives. And uh, what, what are those three questions? I, I know you go over them in, in your book. Yeah, and the three questions. The, fir the first question, um, and and I'll I'll start by just if people want to actually try this, suggesting that you just actually look at a period of time in your life, and that would be the last twenty four hours. This is called daily reflection or daily Nikon. It's the simplest form. Um, and the first question would be, what did I receive from others during the past day? Right, and that could be anything from uh, uh, I received a cup of tea from my wife before I sat down to have this conversation with you. Uh, I received um, the opportunity to go out in the snow at dawn this morning and, and right, just experience what that was like. I received the use of eyeglasses, which I normally wear that helped me to see. So I would just be making a list of all these very practical, concrete things that I've received. The second question is, what have I given? Um, and so I would think, okay, in the past day, what, what did I give or what did I do for others? Well, I, I took my daughter's puppy, Ella, out for a walk, uh, which allowed her to go pee, <laughs> which I think is probably very important to her. I made some uh, little scones out of out of oats that uh, I shared with my wife this morning. So we, uh, we had coffee, which I also made. We had coffee and these nice little oatmeal scones. So those are a couple of things that, that I gave to others. And then the third question, which is often the most challenging, is what trouble and difficulty did I cause others? And uh, that's that's a difficult question for a couple of reasons. One is it's not a question that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, we're much more we pay much more attention to what troubles and difficulties have others caused me. Um, so our attention doesn't focus all the time on the troubles and difficulties that I'm causing others. Um, but another reason is that that's a often a question that really challenges our self-image, who we think we are. Um, so to look at a list of what of troubles and problems that I've been causing people or inconveniences um, is threatening to that self-image. And I think it's a very human response to kind of uh, feel uncomfortable doing that. And on the other hand, from a standpoint of spirituality or religious practice, that's a really important question to be able to kind of challenge our view of ourselves in that way. So those are the the three questions that that people would look at if they're actually trying to practice this. So uh, getting back to to uh, what you said were the kind of three focuses of, of Nikon. You said it was uh, getting away from a complaint based orientation, a, a shift to thinking in terms of, of others, and then being much more uh, purpose uh, focused as opposed to just in, interior focused. What what strikes me about it, and and I want, I wonder what your thoughts are on this, is that. You know, we're we're in such a me culture today. You know, everyone is kind of concerned with themselves and their feelings. Uh, people being canceled out in the social space because somehow they've offended other people's feelings. And it's very hard to know how, what other people are feeling necessarily, right? So you're always walking the line. Should I say this? Should I do that? It just seems so so very very different from uh, most Americans' orientation. 
And I wonder, if, if you look at, say, Japanese uh, society and how oriented it is to your role as a member of a group, there's an inside group, there's an outside group, all the things that you do uh, in, in terms of uh, how, how well you fulfill your role in the group, your, your position in the group, and you're expected in, in a way to subsume your individuality to the needs of the group. I mean, that's, that's like a basic social norm in Japan, and, it's, and it's, I think it, it exists without a lot of challenge. Uh, people who do challenge that particular ethos in Japan often end up leaving the country so they can pursue their artistic freedom and individuality and creativity, say, in France or in England or in the United States, where people are more encouraged to just be yourself and don't worry about what other people think. That seems to be a very broad dividing line between the, the, the two cultures. Uh, do you, do you see that at all? Do you, or do you, do you feel that Nikon in a way is trying to impose almost an, an alien life form on a, you know, <laughs> a very, uh, like, uh, established, uh, Western way of thinking? And is that, is that challenging for the people who take it up? Well, I think your point that there's um, a very dramatic cultural difference between that this kind of Japanese norm and the American norm, the American norm of kind of seeing ourselves as, as independent and the Japanese norm of kind of elevating the, the issue of the, the group or the community. Um, it's clearly, I think, a difference in cultures. And when I did my first Nikon retreat in uh, Japan in 1988, I remember one of one of my teachers was actually being interviewed by someone from the Japanese television station, and they were asking him, "Do you think that Nikon has a, a place in in Western society?" And and so I'll share with you his response. And his first response, which I think addresses part of your question, is, "We have to remember that even though your description, I think, of this kind of societal norm in Japan." I find to be relatively true is that Nikon was developed in Japan for Japanese. So it, it was really developed to address a problem, right? That people were having um, or several problems that people had in that culture. Uh, so I don't, I don't think we can necessarily see it as a uh, transferring cultural norm um, since it was, it was really invented to, to address part of the problems that people were struggling with. But the other thing he said, which I found to be very true now, 30 years later, is that the, the issues that we have in terms of self-centeredness, in, in terms of not being able to see ourselves the way other people kind of see us in terms of being um, maybe insensitive to our impact on not just other people, but the world around us, that that's, he said, this is part of the human condition. This basically transcends culture. And so they may be filtered through a particular type of cultural norm, but the the suffering and the difficulties that they pose for us individually and in our relationships um, really transcend culture. And, and I found that to be absolutely true. You know, having done my training and retreats in Japan, having worked in the US and, and also in, in uh, Europe um, and other places around the world, I find that, the, that those are really our issues of the human condition. Uh, what is what has been the response of people that have gone through the the, the training at uh, say at the Toto Institute? I think the response is very much an individual response. So I'm always very careful when we are putting out flyer announcement or a program announcement that we're doing a retreat, or uh, we do and we annually do a uh, a month of self reflection, which is an online course that I've done for over 25 years. But I can never really say something that, well, if you do this, if you do this program or you do this course, you do this retreat, then this will happen. And I, you hear this in certain forms of spiritual spirituality, I think, particularly in, in the West, um, this kind of promise or guarantee. And I, I don't think we can do that because everybody starts in a different place. Um, but what I think uh, Nikon kind of moves you towards is first of all an awareness of how much we are cared for and supported during the course of our life that often we just become so accustomed to that uh, it's just like you get so used to the fact that you're you have internet where you are that suddenly the internet goes out and now it gets your attention but you know if it if it's been really operating fine for the last six days you, we don't even think about it right and so I think that Nikon kind of pushes us in the direction of actually being aware 
of those things without them not working. That's that's one direction. I think it also helps us become aware of the interdependence that we have with the rest of the world around us, not just people, but but objects, forms of energy. Um, so we begin to see that our interdependence with the world. And I think when we see our interdependence with the world, we naturally become more concerned about the world because we see ourselves as as part of that world, as connected to that world. Um, and it's like the idea if if any of our listeners have children, um, you know, if if you find out that something happened to your child and your child is suffering, whether they're seven years old or 40 years old, you suffer, right? You you if you love your child, then their suffering or their sadness becomes your suffering and your sadness. You have that kind of connection. And imagine how different the world would be if we felt that kind of connection to the whole world, right? And I think that that's probably one of the closest ways we could describe a kind of enlightened approach to a world is one in which everybody felt that connection with not everybody, but everything else in the world. So uh, are you worried for the future of the world? Uh, are, well, let me put it this way. Uh, is, is Nikon a world movement? Do you feel that... Uh, is making inroads, if not Nikon per se, at least the, the say, the teachings of Nikon, this whole idea of being respectful of the interdependence of things and seeing beyond your own nose and understanding uh, how others uh, are affected by everything we do? I don't think it's a world movement in the sense that there are millions of people who are kind of out there at the airports handing out flyers. <laughs> or buying books. <laughs> or, or buying books. Um, but I do think that it's it's a, a force, even if it's a small force, that's kind of pushing the world in a healthier direction. And what the impact of that will be next year or 10 years from now or you know, decades after I die, I have no idea. But I think that from my standpoint, and one of the reasons I've stayed involved in this work for, for over 30 years, is because I think it's a way of helping the world move in the right direction. Now, having said that, I very much believe in the idea that um, if we want to have peace or love in the world, which are wonderful ideas uh, and ideals, uh, we we have to start first with ourselves and secondly with the people that we're in have an immediate connection with. Often, it's it's our family or our close friends. You know, when I I, I spent a season traveling with the Vietnamese Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh um, in the mid nineteen eighties. And he always said, peace starts with, with yourself, and then it, it basically moves to your family. And I think that one of the things that is very doable for all of us is to see Nikon as a way of helping us work with those connections that we have with our partners and with our adult children and with our aging parents and our siblings as we begin to look at the connection we have to those people and we begin to reflect on ourselves and our own um what I call karmic residue in terms of those relationships, I think it has the potential to create a healthier and and, and better relationships uh, in that. And so the world movement is that if we can all work on our own hearts and our own minds and our own family situations, the world really will change. So if, if people want to pursue Nikon, uh, say beyond simply obtaining your book or you know listening to this podcast, are there there you have your own Nikon Center in Vermont? Are there other such places around the United States? I understand there are a couple of Nikon centers in in Europe. Yeah, there's nobody else that's offering Nikon retreats on a regular basis in in North America that I'm aware of. Um, but there's certainly other people um, who have experience with Nikon and who are using it um, in counseling. Uh, I've I've a, a colleague at the. University of Pittsburgh, Clark Chilson, who teaches a course there on, on kind of Buddhism and, and psychology, and he he teaches Nikon. He's been work, been to Japan many times and done Nikon retreats. And there are a number of centers in, in Europe, um, primarily in Germany and Austria, that actually have been around longer than we have in the United States, uh, um, not to mention places like Japan, and, and Nikon uh, has started to kind of take seed in, in places like Australia and China. So I think that that there are little, little there are opportunities, you know, around the, the globe for learning this material. 
um, whether that be in a counselor's you know office or a marriage counselor's office or at a retreat center. Um, but I think a good place to start is to just really start with the practical exercises, m- many of which are in the in my book on Nikon, um, because you can really just start by doing this at home. And a lot of the communications, email that I get from people are people who said, you know, I, I, I worked with this exercise. I t- did 20 minutes of reflection on, the, on my day, and I, I was really quite surprised at what I came up with. So, uh, so you don't have to go to great expense, at least initially, to kind of um, uh, get a taste of what, what this material is like and how it might influence you uh, individually, psychologically, spiritually, and, and also your relationships with others. And if people did want to dive into it deeper, there's the Dodo Institute in in Vermont. Tell me a, a little bit about that. That's been ongoing for, what, 30 years now? Yeah, so we actually are, are celebrating our, our 30th anniversary um, of being a nonprofit organization. We offer a variety of workshops and courses and books. And for instance, I have a, a booklet that we have for Thanksgiving um, that really is kind of a guide to Thanksgiving reflection uh, that we offer to our members. And so uh, for people who are listening, if it's okay, Peter, I'll, sure. I'll give them an, an email address. Um, and I'm, we're happy to send you a digital copy of this just just uh, uh, for free. So if you just email me at uh, Toto, T-O-D-O, like to do at todoinstitute.org. If you just send an email saying, please send me the Thanksgiving booklet, we'll, we'll uh, email you a copy of that. But it's a, a booklet that came from a tradition we had in our own family when my children were very young. I put together just some loose pages and we would do this Thanksgiving reflection in the morning. And we would each take about 45 minutes in a cor- somewhere in a, our own room or a corner of the living room of silence. And each of us would kind of fill in these pages and we just ask, uh, what are some of the things that, that you're thankful for? And there'd be categories like people, animals, forms of energy, people from the past, people in the present. So we had about 10 pages of this and, and we just, whatever you could fill in in 45 minutes. And, um, my daughters would, had were doing this before they could actually write so they would draw pictures like one of the <laughs> animals was our dog barley our golden retriever and so when we looked at that form which i still have there'd be a little picture you know a, of a golden retriever and then we got together and we shared our reflections with each other and it, it's always been the centerpiece of our thanksgiving you know to to really do this private reflection And then share the things that we're really thankful for. And so I really encourage people to go through that process. And the booklet that I've put together is really just a kind of evolution of that into something that's, um, you know, a little bit, has a little bit more depth to it and has the technology so you can actually do it on your phone or your or your tablet or something instead of having to write it out with a pen or pencil. Well, we are about, as we speak now, we're about a week uh, before Thanksgiving, so if anyone is listening to this, I, I'm not sure when it's going to drop, but there might be time right before Thanksgiving to get a get a hold of that booklet. And yeah, could you read out the email address one more time, Greg? Sure, it's uh, T O D O, like the word to do, and then the at symbol at todoinstitute.org. So it's T O D O, the word institute, and that's all one word. Dot org. Just say, uh, you know, subject Thanksgiving booklet, and then just say, please send me the Thanksgiving booklet, and uh, um, we'll go ahead and, and send that to you. So, uh, Greg, b- before we started speaking today, I was asking about the uh, the name Toto Institute because I was thinking, well, a lot of people are maybe going to read it as to do because that's that's kind of a, th- a thing in the uh, the world of efficient uh, and improved lifestyle right setting up all these to-do lists and to-do apps and and whatnot so tell me about where where did the name toto come from well the 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 name originally was um developed by david reynolds who is one of the uh, first people that introduced me to nikon um but the word itself todo really has three meanings and so in vermont we're always referred to as the to-do institute and we we just kind of accept that but actually because the other side of our work this is the reflective side and the other side is uh, the action side the other side of our work is very action oriented so actually to do is a good fit 
for that side of our work. In Japan, in Japanese, the word Todo is actually a Japanese word. The To is the same To as in Tokyo, so it means Eastern, right? And uh, Do means uh, the way, right? So really, uh, Todo means Eastern way. Oh, okay. right. Todo is also a Spanish word. And uh, for those of you who, who know some Spanish, Todo means all or everything. Um, so we, it actually has a meaning in, in English, Japanese, and Spanish. <laughs> make, it, make it very easy to remember. Um, and now you have a whole section in your book on holidays, and you kind of go, go through all the different holidays. There, there's I wouldn't say it's prescribed, but there's like suggested exercises for all the different holidays and how to how to approach kind of all the different uh, things that happen throughout the year, as well as say landmarks in your mm-hmm. life, uh, marriage, uh, funerals, uh, graduations, etc. Et uh, so Nikon really something that once people are kind of absorbed it into their life, is it something that they do every day? I don't. I don't think it's necessarily something they do every day. But I think that there's a if if you um, read or study or practice Japanese psychology, I think that there's a kind of a spirit in it. It's a spirit in part of gratitude. And so, uh, if I can just quickly kind of share one of the the exercises, which which we would use at at Christmas time, you could use it any gift giving time. But basically. When we decorate the Christmas tree, and again, we we would do this with our children when they were living with us, they're now in their 20s, we would do one ornament at a time, and a person would pick an ornament, and they would get go up to the tree, and they'd say, I'd like to dedicate this ornament to, and they would name a person, right, who we wanted to acknowledge had really been a positive force, either in our family's life or in their life. My my daughters, for instance, took Suzuki uh, method piano lessons for about six years and they had this wonderful teacher jody and so often she would get an ornament um, and sometimes it was they could find an ornament that looked a little like a piano or something and so we would dedicate our ornaments and the process of decorating the tree went on for days because we would do like a half an hour every evening or something like that but every ornament on that tree was dedicated to somebody and it was a very meaningful exercise as opposed to just kind of Let's let's get all the ornaments on so the tree looks really shiny and nice, um, and then and then move on and put on the lights and everything. So that that type of an exercise, which I, I've always really enjoyed, I think is an example of the kind of spirit that really comes from, in this case, the the Nikon work of being able to notice and be aware of how we're supported and and cared for by other people. Well, Greg, uh, thank you very much for uh, for taking time today and talking talking about Nikon. And congratulations again on the 20th anniversary of the book, which has just been uh, released uh, yesterday. And if you would like to find out more about Greg Creech and Nikon, how should people get in touch? You have a website, I'm sure. Yeah, the website is a good place to start. And, it, and the website is actually 30,000days.org. So it's, it's the words 30 thousand days dot org and that name which is also the name of the journal that that we publish thirty thousand days is uh, a rough estimate of the number of days that each of us has to live so it's a reminder that you know our life has an end point and it's important for us to basically do the things that are important for us to do you know while we still have some of those thirty thousand days left well thank you very much uh greg i would suggest to people that they Check out, check out your book. It's full of uh, very short chapters, lots of easy examples, exercises. And if you want to find out more about Nikon, by all means, um, go to 30,000 Days uh, online and get more information. Uh, with the holidays coming up, it's certainly a time of reflection. People are on vacation, spending time with family, having a lot of those old uh, interactions uh, come up again as you see parents and and relatives and whatnot it's a it's a good opportunity to talk about uh, the family and how things have grown and developed and a good opportunity to, to reconnect over uh, memories and uh, daily interactions uh, it's a real gift you've given to the world uh, Greg by uh, assembling all this material into a very very easily digestible form I appreciate it and uh, we're very glad to have been able to publish your book not once but twice <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Peter. And and, uh, I I think of us as a kind of team that uh, is, including Michael, that's basically helping to get this out into the world and hopefully have a 
uh, a really positive um, effect on, on marriage and on families and on uh, the overall situation in the world. So we'll, we'll see how that unfolds. But thank you for being part of that. And thank you for having me as a guest on the podcast today. Thank you very much, Greg. Bye-bye.